Um, I know this is quickly becoming the cliche of the meeting, but it really is great to be back and to be able to present this work to you in person. Um, so, as Danny said, uh, my name's Dan, and I lead the applications team at Oxford Nanopore. I'm going to be talking to you about a process called epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is something that the team's been working on for quite some time now. And as Danny said, the title of my talk is, I was hoping to be able to see it on the, on the screen, but it's a single platform for multiomics. Um, but I've added a surtitle to it, which is even the kitchen sink for reasons that should become quite clear before too long. But I want to clarify the, the multiomics aspects of the title. I know this means different things to different people, but um, we're using my interpretation for this talk, which is uh, we're, looking at, we're looking at the epithelial to mesenchymal transition in lots of different ways, uh, from multiple different angles and at multiple different levels of resolution. Now, the work that I'm going to be presenting uh, draws very heavily on work done by uh, our genomic application showcasing team and on our benchmarking teams. The showcasing team, they're here to illustrate and to really stretch the capabilities of nanopore sequencing. And the benchmarking team is here to measure um, how well the platform performs on uh, a range of very standard ana analyses, such as SNP calling, SV calling, methylation, and so on. And they also report on best practice as well, so that you know, if you want to do a particular analysis, the benchmarking team will tell you what the best combination of library prep and analysis tools is for that particular job. Now, as you might have come to expect from the applications team, uh, we're presenting a whole lot of different things here today, um, far more than I can possibly fit into this presentation, although I'll try to do my best. Um, we're presenting on a diverse range of subjects from uh, things like measuring telomere length to, to metagenomics. Um, some of these things just don't fit into the talk, um, so you know, I can't fit those in. But if there are things that you see, all the posters are on display, either in the auditorium, uh, just in front of the live lounge, and they're also available online. So please check them out if you get the opportunity. And there are also lots of people from the applications team here as well. So if you have questions about the stuff we're presenting, then please come and find one of us, and we'd be delighted to have a conversation with you. If there are any avid Pelmanists in the audience, yes, we have used the same picture on more than one of these posters, but take it from me that there are 24 different things um, that we're presenting that you, know, you can take home and read at your leisure or you know, read here. Okay, so on with the talk. So as I said, I'm going to be talking to you about a, a process called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And this is a, a really complex biological process where epithelial cells take on the characteristics and behavior of mesenchymal cells. And we're going to be, well, I'll be talking about how we investigated this biological process from a lot of different angles and a lot of different resolutions. But if you only take away one point from this talk, it's that we're able to do this huge set of different analyses using only nanopore data and some basic lab consumables and some bioinformatics know-how. So all of the chemistries and software that we used, um, all of the tools, they're all available to you now. So you could go home and you could replicate all of this work right away without any updates that we haven't released yet. Okay, so I suppose a good place to start would be, why should you be interested in, in anything that I'm about to present? What, what is it about epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT, as I'm going to carry on calling it from now on? This is a natural biological process, so it happens in things like um, embryo, early embryo development and wound healing. But it's also one of the initiating factors in metastasis, and that's what got us interested in it. And as you can imagine, that when cells shift their phenotype from one sort of cell to a completely different sort of cell, then there are going to be lots of changes at the genomic, epigenomic, and transcriptomic levels that we can look at. OK, so what are epithelial cells? Well, as this figure shows, it's a thin layer of cells that line the, um, the outer surfaces of organs and blood vessels. And so here we're showing um, a layer of epithelial cells lining uh, the lung. If we can zoom in a little bit further, I mean, this is obviously you know, my cartoon of what epithelial cells really look like. But the point is to illustrate some of the defining characteristics of epithelial cells. But here's a picture of, of some real ones so you can see how accurate the representation is. So epithelial cells have got some, some, like I say, some defining characteristics. Particularly, they've got a very regular shape, so they're kind of rectangular. They're also very closely interconnected, so that you have these protein fibers that link one epithelial cell to another, so they form this interconnected layer. And they also have a polarity. So the membrane that faces into the organ has got a different composition from the membrane that faces out of the organ. So if we now introduce a tumor, then after a few days, we'll start to see other sorts of cells appearing. 
And in this figure, we, we're looking at the blue ones. These are the mesenchymal cells. The, the green ones are kind of in a transition state. They are neither epithelial entirely nor mesenchymal. But it's the blue ones that we're talking about. And as the cartoon and the photograph show, these look very different from epithelial cells. I'm not talking about the color. It's more about the shape. But they don't have this regular rectangular shape. They're more spindle-shaped. Um, they're also not interconnected. They're, these are free-floating cells. They don't have a polarity, and what's more, they're pluripotent, so they can change from one cell type into another, and they can also invade tissues. So during um, metastasis, what happens is that an epithelial cell becomes an epithelial tumor cell, and then that changes into a mesenchymal cell, which can then enter the, enter the bloodstream. And it can then travel to another part of the body, where it can invade the tissues there, and it invades the epithelial tissues. And then it can do the reverse of the process, so where it changes back from a mesenchymal cell to an epithelial cell, and it starts an epithelial tumor there. So the process um, of EMT takes place over the course of several days, and it's induced by growth factors, um, in particular TGF-beta, which is the, the growth factor that we use in the lab to bring about the transition. So how did we do the experiments in the first place? So we started off with some human lung cancer, some human lung epithelial cancer cells, so HCC827 for those who, who know it. And we grew these in the lab in the usual way. And once the cells were established, we added some TGF-beta, the growth factor, that's, that initiates the transition from epithelial to mesenchymal cells. And we can see these changing shape over the course of several days. And during that time, we're able to take samples and we can extract DNA and RNA and then we can do our analyses, our sequencing and analyses on these samples. So I'm going to get into the analyses that we did here. Um, so which analyses were those? Well, the, the answer is pretty much all of the analyses, all the ones that we could think of, which I think is, is most of them anyway. So I'm going to start by talking about bulk transcriptomics. And by bulk transcriptomics, we're talking about gene expression and looking for isoforms, isoform discovery, but done on a number of cells. And so you get a kind of average of what's going on in all of those cells. So it's a kind of a zoomed out way of looking at what's going on in the cell at any one time. But before I tell you about the results, I'm just going to say a little bit about a new um, PCR cDNA kit that we released a while ago and where all of these experimental results, the, the one that was used to generate all of this data. So with our PCS111, um, the, the benefits to you, the consumer, are that you get a higher number of reads that are mappable. Um, also, by the way that the adapter goes on, you retain the poly-A tail in those strands, and so you're able to measure the poly-A tail length of transcripts if you're looking at you know, eukaryotic mRNAs, and if you're interested in that, doing that kind of thing. And we also introduce um, a unique molecular identifier into the strand-switching oligo, which gives us better ability to quantify those transcripts. But even without that, with all of the improvements to the kit and the, the platform generally that have gone in the background, we're now at the point where we can quantify genes, um, we can count the expression level of genes as well as any other platform out there. Um, and you know, in particular, I'm talking about short read sequencing. So we're as good at gene quantification um, as any short read sequencer can do. But because we can also sequence full length transcripts, the whole thing, it means that we're able to see isoforms, we're able to reconstruct isoforms. And we do this as well as any other sequencing platform that there might be out there, any long read sequencer. So the, the, to do this, I mean, right, right now, I'd recommend that you do a separate library prep for each one, but I think that's a small price to pay, I mean, both figuratively and literally, to get both data sets from a single platform. So on with the EMT cells. So I'm going to start by talking about gene expression, which, as the subtitle says, is a very zoomed out way of seeing what's going on in the cell at that point in time. So we sequenced our different time course uh, cDNAs, and we, plotted, we did a differential gene expression analysis, and the volcano plot showing those results is, is here. And you can see a whole load of different genes that get upregulated during the EMT process, and those are shown on the right of the figure, and a whole load of genes that get downregulated during the process, and those are shown on the left of the figure. But the ones that I want to draw your particular attention to are the three that have got the green ovals around them, and these are vimentin, E cadherin or CDH1 and N cadherin or CDH2. And the thing that's, that's notable about these genes is that they're all well known EMT markers. And I'm going to refer to them a few times during the course of the presentation. So, vimentin is the major cytoskeletal protein in mesenchymal cells. So, you would expect the expression level to go up during the transition from epithelial to mesenchymal. 
And that is what you see. That's why it's where it is on the volcano plot. And then we have the cadherins. So switching of expression from CDH1 to CDH2 is one of the, kind of the I suppose, the landmark events of, of the EMT process. So this is a, a kind of gene level view of what's going on in the cell um, during this process. And it's, it's, like I say, a very zoomed out way of going about it. If you want to really know what's happening in a cell to, on, at the expression level, you really need to start looking at isoforms, though. I mean, the gene level expression can give you a certain amount of information, but it's possible to zoom in further. And if you have long reads, if you have full length transcripts, you have that in your data set. So what we've done here is we've pulled out an example where the isoforms that are expressed during the process of EMT switch from one to another. And the best example that we could find in the data set was, it, it wasn't for one of the cadherins, it was for a gene called CD44. Um, so sorry that it's not entirely consistent, but you know, that's biology for you. Um, but CD44 is um, it's a cell surface adhesion molecule, and it's well known, the, the switching of isoforms in CD44 is a well known event that happens during metastasis. So it's reassuring that we do see this, and hopefully you can see that the of all the, the four isoforms listed in the figure on the right, that the bottom one, the expression level of that, changes quite substantially during the process. Okay, so we started off with a very zoomed out way of looking at the, um, the RNA in the cell, which is the bulk gene expression. We've zoomed in and have started looking at the bulk isoforms, but we can zoom in even further and look at expression level on a single cell basis. The reason that we might want to do this is that doing a bulk expression analysis assumes that all the cells in the sample are saying the same thing, that they're all telling the same story. And we don't know that that's true. And the way that we can tease that apart is by looking at the expression in cells individually. And so that's what we're doing. Now, at Oxford Nanopore, we're great fans of all different single cell methodologies, but we wanted to keep this story all about Nanopore data. And so we used a method called SplitSeq for this. And this just use, uses basic um, laboratory consumables. So the idea is that you start off with a number of cells, something like 150,000 different cells. And you then permeabilize these, uh, you fix them and permeabilize them, and you split them across 48 wells of a 96-well plate. And you then do your reverse transcription in the cell using a barcoded reverse transcription primer. You then pool all of, all of those 48 wells together, and you split them again, this time between 96 wells of a plate, and then you add an additional barcode. So it's, it's repeated layer, levels of repeated rounds of pooling, splitting, and adding a barcode, and pooling and splitting and adding a barcode. So we had the second barcode, we pull, we split again, this time across 96 wells, and we had a third barcode. And then we pull, and for the final time, we split across eight well, eight tubes, at which point we had a barcoded sequencing adapter. So what we're doing, we're building up layers of barcodes on these strands, and we create something like three and a half million different barcodes in the process. And I, I, the, the point, I suppose, is that this is a very manual process. It's a little bit, little bit like the Flintstones car in that you have to do all of the work yourself, but it will get you there. And so there's very little chance of any two cells having the same barcode because we have so many more barcode combinations than we have, have, of, the, have of the cells. Okay, so let's look at the analysis. The difficulty here is that for every cell, we've looked at something like 20,000 different genes. So we've created a very multi-dimensional data set. And we have to then, for the sake of visualization, we have to flatten that down um, into two dimensions, which is what's happened here. So what you're looking at is one circle, one color, shows you one cell at a different time point. So blue represents the cells at day zero before the treatment. Orange represents the cells at day four. and green circles represent the cells at day eight after treatment. And the fact that day zero, four, and eight cluster to different parts of this two-dimensional representation show you that the experiment worked, that there are enough differences happening at the, le at the transcriptomic level that we can tease all of these cells apart. So now we have this representation, we can then start to layer individual genes onto that um, and use a, a heat map to kind of show the level of expression. Now, I really hope that that, that makes sense. I mean, it's a I have a layman's understanding of it, so that's the best I can communicate, but I think it will become clearer when we start to put the individual genes on here. So if we start with CDH1, the clusters still represent the same things. So we still have blue representing the cells at day zero, orange representing the cells at day four, and green representing the cells at day eight. And what you can hopefully see 
is the expression level of CDH1 goes down after day zero. I mean, if you're sitting really close to the front or you've got especially good eyesight, you might see that in some of the cells on day eight, the expression level has actually gone up, but overall, you're getting less CDH1 produced. But what's also striking about this is that not all of the cells are saying the same thing, that some of them have a very low expression level right at the start, and it continues to be low throughout. This could be that not all of the cells are, doing, not all of the cells are going through the EMC process. Some of them might not have been transformed by the TGF beta, although looking at the phenotype on the plates, it looked like they had all started transitioning, but, but maybe that wasn't the case. Or maybe they are transitioning, but we're looking at the wrong markers for them. They're doing it in a different way. I don't know, and if anyone knows the answer, I'd be, I'd be really, really interested to find out. So let's look at CDH2 now. So we can see that the expression of CDH2 on a single cell basis goes from very, very little indeed at day zero, so there may be one cell that's expressing enough of this for us to detect it, to slightly more than nothing after day four and day eight. But this is, very, this is consistent with the idea of cadherin switching, that the expression of CDH1 goes down and the expression of CDH2 goes up. And then if we come to look at Vimentin, the other marker that I talked about, the, the cytoskeletal um, you know, components of, of mesenchymal cells, it doesn't look like any more cells are expressing uh, Vimentin over the course of this experiment, but it does look, look, look like those that are doing are expressing it much more strongly, which accounts for the, you know, the increase in gene expression in the bulk transcriptomic plot. Now, of course, if we, we could zoom in one level further still. So this is, the, so I suppose, the third level of zoom. We started off with bulk gene expression. We went then for bulk isoform uh, expression. Now we're talking about single cell gene expression. So the next level of zoom, as of zoomed in as you could get, would be to look at isoforms on the single cell level. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have time to plot that, to, to run those analyses, although it is present in our data set because all of our reads are the full-length transcript. But we have got a poster showing this in a different context, which is to look, at for, um, it's to look at antibody transcripts in beta cells. So please have a look at that if you need any more convincing. So as I said at the beginning, RNA analyses give you a snapshot of what's happening in cells at a given point in time. But if you want to see what's driving those changes, it's necessary to look at the DNA. So now we're going to switch from uh, transcriptomics to genomics and look at the DNA, but in a very zoomed out sort of way. And that is to look at the 3D organization of the genome. Now, if, if you're used to looking at um, cytogenetic fish images, you might be used to the idea that chromosomes can float around individually from, the, from one another, kind of like inflatables in a swimming pool. But in practice, in a nucleus, um, it's, it's a much, much tighter fit than that. So it's equivalent to fitting something like 20 kilometers of, of spaghetti or string or something into a, into a tennis ball. It's that kind of you know, problem, really. And, and the way that this has to be done is that the, the strands have to be very thin in the first place, which they just happen to be, but they also need to be folded up. And so you get something that looks much more tangled. But in fact, the tangling isn't random at all. It's not really a tangle. Um, it just looks like that that regions of the genome that are close together in three-dimensional space um, are there for a reason. It's not a random folding. I mean, obviously, the regions that are close together in the primary sequence are going to be close together in three-dimensional space, but there are regions that are not in the primary sequence close together, but still need to be close together. And so the results of this is that chromosomes tend to occupy different parts of the nucleus from one another, but also regions that have long-range interactions are also close in three-dimensional space. And we can explore this. We can explore the 3D conf confirmation of genomes using a method called PORC. So uh, me, my colleague Cecil Yule, and my other colleague Owen Harrington have spoken at quite some length about this method, PORC. Um, so I'm not going to go into any more detail about that here. Um, there's a preprint that's on the bioarchive, and this is the result of a collaboration between us and Marcin Emilinski at the New York Genome Center. And I think there's also a Nature Biotech paper coming out uh, imminently now that shows all of the different applications to which you can put poor C data. But when we do this on our um, EMT cells, um, we plot a diagram like this. I mean, it's, it's possibly sl the labeling slightly simplified, but we have one genome against itself and the other genome against itself, one before treatment, one after treatment. And probably the most striking thing about the figure that you'll, you'll notice straight away is that there's this diagonal line going from the top left to the bottom right. What this shows you is that 
parts of the genome that are close together in the primary sequence are also close together in the 3D conformation of the genome. So no massive surprise there. Um, but this is tremendously useful if you're trying to scaffold assemblies. But that's not what, what I'm going to talk about now. What we're interested here is things that are off the diagonal. And so if we look here, we can see um, a region of cadherin 2 that is different in the control sample versus the treatment sample. It suggests that the chromatin is reorganizing during the cadherin switching process, which probably doesn't come as a surprise given that the expression of CDH2 should be going up. Okay, so I'm now going to zoom in um, a level further and look at, um, well, look more closely at the DNA and RNA. Sorry, at the DNA. And I'm talking here about structural variants, SNPs, methylation, and copy number variants. And the question that I'm, I suppose, going to start with is asking, would you expect the genome, the primary sequence of a genome, to, to change noticeably upon the phenotype shift from epithelial to mesenchymal when the growth factor TGF beta is added? But before I get to that, I'm going to ask another question, which is, if there were these sorts of changes, would we see them? And so this is, this is obviously just a flagrant attempt to fit in some of our benchmarking data so I can show you just how good we are at detecting SNPs, SVs, methylation, and copy number variants. So I'm going to start off with, um, with methylation. If you've heard any of us talking before, you must have heard us saying that Nanopore technology is the only sequencing technology that looks directly at the strands of DNA or RNA from the organism. So we're not looking at the products of a synthesis reaction. And what that means is that if you have modified bases in your strand or if you have um, damaged bases in the strand, they all go through the pore and they all affect the signal. And so the, the challenge then becomes trying to make sense of that signal. And we have teams at Oxford Nanopore who've you know, spent a huge amount of effort in trying to deconvolute that signal. And you know, call me biased if you like, but they've done an exceptional job at it. We are, we are now stunningly good at detecting 5 methyl C. And the bar chart on the right is, illustrates that. It's how many CPGs we detect in a human genome compared to bisulfite. Now, it does raise a question, um, which you could use as an, as an icebreaker at the poster if you want to catch one of the team, which is, if you compare yourself to bisulfite, how can you possibly say that you're better than bisulfite? Well, we do say that, we do do that comparison, and we've got good reason to, so um, we'll tell you about it another time. But for those of you who are more interested in, in correlations, the figure on the bottom left shows you how closely we correlate um, our methylation calling to bisulfite data for the regions that bisulfite can, can cover. We can cover the whole genome, as Gordon was saying this morning. Um, bisulfite covers less of it, but where we, where we do agree, sorry, where we do overlap, we agree. Now on to SNPs and SVs. Now my, my colleague, Steve Reed, is going to be talking about some of the latest chemistry, some data from our latest chemistry um, in his presentation later on. And the, the quality of the data that he's going to be showing you is absolutely mind-blowing. Um, but the point that I want to make with this slide is that even with the previous versions of our sequencing chemistry, we were already very, very good at detecting single nucleotide polymorphisms and structural variants. So we can detect SNPs with a precision recall and F1 value of about 99.8%. So the point I'm trying to make is that if there are changes to the single, nucleot single nucleotide level between epithelial and mesenchymal cells, we will spot them. And it's a similar story with structural variants. This, we are now at the point where the reason that the numbers are not, at, not higher than this is it's the limitation of the truth set that we're using to do our comparisons, not a limitation of the technology itself. So you know, I'm confident in saying that there is no sequencing technology that can do a better job at detecting structural variants than we can. And this is all very well. It's great to be able to detect SNPs and structural variants and methylation and stuff like that. But what we're most interested in is the ability to phase all of these variants. So we can use um, informative SNPs um, to separate reads out into two different haplotypes. And we can create, as shown on our uh, haplotype phasing poster, we can create huge phase blocks across the human genome. And because of this, it allows us to fold in methylation information as well. So we can look at imprinted regions of the genome, uh, which are regions that we know to be differently methylated between maternal and paternal chromosomes. And because our phase blocks are so big, we can incorporate that in, whereas if the phase blocks had been smaller, we wouldn't be able to, but they are and we can. And so what this means is that rather than just saying, this is haplotype 1, this is haplotype 2, we can say, this is the maternal haplotype, this is the paternal haplotype. 
And in doing that, it means that we don't then need to do trio sequencing. We can just sequence an individual and tease their chromosomes apart into maternal and paternal, which is you know, a, a tremendous leap forward. I would be as bold as to say. All right, so let's look at the, um, the EMT samples. So we, we didn't really find any SNPs or structural variants that happened during the transition from epithelial to mesenchymal, and we never really expected to. But what we can do is look for those things um, as a consequence of the transition from healthy epithelial cells to cancerous epithelial cells. And so we started off in a very zoomed out way by looking, doing a very low pass, well, I suppose a, a low resolution copy number screen across the whole genome sort of 50,000, uh, 50 kilobase bins, so sort of array level resolution. Now you'd expect in, in a normal situation to have two copies of everything, but in this region of chromosome seven, close to the centromere, we can see that we've got a massive amplification event. And it looks like this is the region around the EGFR gene. As the epidermal growth factor is a, a gene that is duplicated or amplified in lots of cancers, so it's no real surprise to find it there. But at this level of resolution, we can't be absolutely certain that it is amplified. It, it could just be regions that are on either side of it. So we have to zoom in to get a better look. Now, because we have long reads, it means that we can map all the way across really, really structurally complex regions without any ambiguity. And so that's what we've done here. And so we can see a few things. We can confirm that the, I don't know if I can laser that, no, but the EGFR gene sits in the middle of the most highly, I suppose, the, the deepest copy number region. So we know that the EGFR gene is most certainly amplified here. But what we can also see, it's, it's a more complicated situation than we might have thought. But it's not just that the whole of the three megabase region is uniformly amplified. There's lots of substructure in there and a lot of sharp edges as well, which tells us that there are complex structural variation events going on in here. So we can zoom in and have a look at these breakpoints. And of course, we can see these down to single base resolution. So if you look at the one on the left, you can see that the coverage plot has got, it's, it's very square, very sharp edges. And it's, a, it's an incredibly cleanly delineated inverted duplication to, to those in the know who can spot these things. And at the other side of the SV, we have another, the, the same story, another cleanly delineated um, inverted duplication. And so by doing this, by teasing apart all the breakpoints and understanding what's going on, the types of inversion, or the, sorry, the types of structural variant, we can start to understand the mechanism of the amplification reaction. But we can also zoom in further than this as well. And we can phase the reads. So here I'm showing um, some phased reads which are covering one of the exons of, of uh, EGFR, which I think is exon 19. Now we could see a 15 base deletion in, in many of our reads, in the majority of our reads. But it's not until we phase these reads that we can see that this is only happening in one of the haplotypes. And so it's until you start to phase read, you can't really understand fully the biology that's going on. But we can see here that the deletion exists in one of the haplotypes only, and this is a haplotype, it's a deletion that's called by ClinVar as pathogenic. I think it's, it's an activating mutation in EGFR. Um, so it's likely to be you know, one of the things that was at the root of the, the reason that the cell was cancerous in the first place. But we can also see that that is exclusively the haplotype that was amplified. Right, so these are things that happened in the cancer, not in the transition to mesenchymal. We didn't see things changing like that. But then we haven't looked at methylation yet. So we did. Now, of course, we can sequence a whole genome. We can call methylation across a whole genome. Um, but we chose to do something different here. If you remember the expression plots that we showed before, I showed before the volcano plot showing genes that are upregulated and genes that are downregulated, there were lots of those. And so we took those regions and we built an adaptive sampling bed file so that we could then sequence specifically those regions and look for methylation in the reads that we got. And that's what the blue bars indicate in this whole genome plot. We can then do a differential methylation analysis, right? and we can see that after six days of treatment, a whole load of different regions that we identified in this way do display differential methylation. But if we come back again 10 days later, after day 16, we can see that the number of differentially methylated regions has gone up, and it's also shifted as well. And of course, we can zoom in even further. So we can look at individual genes, of course, and this is um, a histone cluster on chromosome 6. Now, the activity level of histones is known to be one of the sort of governing factors uh, that, that underlines kind of alternative splicing in metastasis and EMT. And so it's probably not that surprising 
uh, that we see that upon treatment with TGF-beta and transformation to mesenchymal cells, that we see the methylation across this histone cluster uh, really go from, from not that much to, to quite substantial. Okay, I think I'm going to end there unless there's anything... No, okay. I was hoping for some last-minute data to come in, but that doesn't seem to have fallen out just yet. So I'm going to wrap up by summarizing everything that I've shown you and talked about, um, which is that it's possible just with nanopore data to do a whole range of different analyses um, at the both levels of DNA and RNA. And these analyses can be done at different re levels of resolution as well. You can do very zoomed out um, analyses. You can do very zoomed in analyses. You can do all of the analyses. And in doing so, we've gained a deeper understanding of some of the processes that happen during epithelial to mesenchymal transition. But also, we've been able to shed some lights on the events that happened in the transition from healthy epithelial cells to lung cancer cells. And we've done it, I mean, just to get back to the title, we've done it by throwing the kitchen sink at it, but a nanopore branded kitchen sink. So I'd like to finish just by acknowledging a few people, um, saying thanks, particular thanks to Cecil, Yule, Philip Reschenada, and Scott Hickey um, in the team who helped to get all of these results together for me to present today. But also thanks to everyone in APPS and ONT. Um, before I go, I'd like to say, if you're interested in single cell analysis, please don't miss Owen Harrington's talk tomorrow. I think he's in the classroom at quarter past one, and he's going to be talking about SOCI, which is our bioinformatics pipeline for single cell analysis. And please remember to check out all of the posters and handouts that we've got on display. And thank you very much for your attention. And I think there might be time for a question or two.